Okay. So, the first order of business I think someone asked is to kind of formally go over the last midterm, especially while it's fresh in my mind. So, um, how does the crystallography of a semiconductor control, semiconductor band structure, relate to cause and effect relationships? What I was trying to go at there was, um, actually I need to go back to one of these 331 charge motion density of states, not that one, probably this one. Uh, no, actually probably even earlier than that. Yeah, quantum mechanics. What I was trying to point out is that, um, like this might be a useful one, is that if you follow that 1D uh, chronic penny model where we kind of line up the atoms in this linear array, then the splitting of the bands into the ba particular band gaps that manifest uh, is dependent upon that interatomic spacing. And one way I was kind of making an analogy to that is think of a Fourier series expansion of that where you would have terms that would have <coughs> resonances consistent with the atomic positions. So you can imagine that if I spread this out like an accordion and change the interatomic spacing, that's going to change the frequencies of those Fourier components. <coughs> so uh, then what I was trying to say is relate that back to the fact that it's, um, as I say, uh, the crystallography, related to the crystallography, is point out, and I don't know if I have that. Do I have that? Uh, segment three, I need to go back to the original <coughs> segment. Uh, let's do a, let's do a segment, you know, segment one bond. Yeah, this one. Let's take our classic zinc blend, say, which should be coming up right about there. So I'm trying to point out that if you um, put that, extend that out as this linear one-dimensional uh, array and think of the uh, band structure that's going to manifest as I'm going along this axis, recognize that that's different if I'm going, you know, uh, diagonally off or so forth, and I'm going to hit a different periodicity of atoms going off in different directions. So then when we relate to the uh, 331 density of state, probably this one, this one, no, that's for me. Too many things open. No, that's, sorry, sorry, sorry. Area of statistics. Where'd my quantum mechanics one go? Oh, I had quantum mechanics open. Yeah, okay, that's right here. Yeah. So then when I, um, uh, so you know, this is like uh, kind of like a Fourier expansion. If I extend that out into the different directions, then you can see, yeah, the more rigorous band structure that. That's the zero, that's the gamma point. So then going off in these different crystallographic directions through the lattice, you're going to see different periodicities. So the whole thing, so this is like one one-dimensional solution. This is like a one, another one-dimensional solution. And they're all stitched together to, to basically, with that origami thing, this is, this is basically now representing three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional piece of paper. That's, that's what I'm saying. So, so you can see that these are off in different directions. You get different solutions going off in different directions. And it all comes back to the crystallography in the different directions. Okay, so that's what I was trying to relate to. Uh, what are direct, indirect uh, bands? Well, that's right here in front of us, actually. Here's a direct band gap. So recognize that uh, this is the momentum on the x-axis, and I think that was one of the big things that people were missing. There's momentum. Uh, momentum conservation is such that a carriers can go back and forth between this gamma point and this gamma point in the conduction and valence bands respectively, and momentum is conserved and everything's preserved. 
however, to, to, trans, to transition from this um, uh, conduction band minimum and this valence band minimum. And I think some people confuse terms. I haven't been too uh, mean-spirited about that yet, but this is a minimum and a minimum. Remember, whole energy, this is the minimum, not the maximum. I know it looks like a maximum to you, but holes that stand on your head, okay? Um, so that this requires a phonon uh, for momentum conservation. So you can either be emitting a phonon or, or absorbing a phonon. Of course, you're not going to absorb many phonons if it's low temperature. But I need some secondary particle, at least one particle. And I get there by really... Uh, if I, if I really have a crazy random event, I, you know, I could get there by six particle interactions, right? But the chances of six particles lining up are pretty remote. So, but either way, momentum conservation has to be preserved, and I have to get from here to there somehow, right? So that's uh, what you need to, to relate. Uh, question three was describe the mean of the density of states and roughly how it's distributed. Um, I got a lot of people um, pointing out this stuff, you know, so I had made this cartoon, if you will, trying to amplify this density of states. Like we could just come up with these imaginary um, uh, distributions where here it's a triangle, here's a rectangle, um, here's a um, Here's an upside down triangle. So I saw this on a lot of people's papers. This is not formally correct, I want you to recognize. This is just a cartoon. Uh, I wasn't really dinging everybody on this, I don't think. But um, uh, this is maybe a closer representation. It really goes up by the square root of energy. Um, so I'll go back, which one? I want to, uh, oops, not that one. Something one? No, I don't think so. I don't think I want you. I want. Oh, yeah, this one might work. Uh, so density states. Yeah. So here we have. Yeah, this is showing it. So this is the density of states, right? N of e, the number of states. If I take a sliver out of this um, at that particular point, it means that a little delta E, I take a little delta E sliver, I have very few energy levels which I can put carriers. But as I go deeper into the bands, it's going up by the square root of E. So as I go deeper into the bands and I take another little same delta E sliver, I have many more places to put carriers. So I have more carriers, more places to put carriers as I go deeper this way, or even if I go deeper this way, okay? So again, kind of like that parking garage analogy, I'm going, as I'm going uh, higher up, I'm getting more parking spaces, right? Everybody parks at the ground floor, right? And, and so I have to go higher and higher up, and I find more spaces. But then when you convolve that onto the, um, uh, the, the second part of the question is the carrier distribution. You have to convolve that onto the Fermi Dirac statistics, and so then this is the carrier concentration in the conduction and valence bands that I'm talking about. So I was trying to, to, to see, to make sure that you had some understanding that carriers do not really sit at the band uh, extrema. Very, very few carriers are really there. They're actually sitting a little bit above. Right. And it's because there's hardly any places to put them. So when you convolve these two, that's more. And I just wanted to see a sensitivity that that's the case. That they're not necessarily sitting at the bottom. <coughs> okay. Explain the three temperature zones. I think that's in the same slide deck, isn't it? No, it's not. Uh, da, da. It's sigma three. Segment. <coughs> Yeah, uh, there's the same stuff again, by the way. Yeah, that's, that's the same thing. Uh, temperature zones. Yeah, this, this bad boy. So uh, here it is, intrinsic, extrinsic ionization. So in ionization, you're in the process, and of course this is cold, 
and this is hot, and in the ionization, you are in the process of ionizing either the donor or the acceptor. Some people got all confu uh, confused. I'm not sure I really marked off too many points, but they were trying to give me so much information, kind of that diarrhea effect, that they were giving me the donors and acceptors at the same time. And um, I don't want a co-doped uh, material. That's, that's uh, compensated, and that is neither here nor there, literally. Um, so this is ionization. So I, I'm starting to release the donors. So the first band diagram should be, if you chose a donor material, that I have some of these guys uh, releasing. Maybe, maybe this guy isn't fully ionized. You know, if you really want to be precise. Uh, and then this guy released and so forth. And then maybe another neutral. So you're in the process of releasing these. When you get to the, uh, bless you, when you get to the extrinsic, it's fully ionized. Every one of these is now released because uh, I'm at room temperature. KT is 26 milli electron volts by then, and this is probably on uh, 10 to 15 milli electron volts. So I fully ionized, so it plateaus, so I, I've saturated. Very few carriers. So by that time, this guy has now released. So this is the extrinsic zone. And maybe I might have one Hussein bolt. Maybe one or so, and a little abbreviated cartoon like this um, that went band to band. But generally speaking, it's all extrinsic. Then here, I got that band to band transitions, and these guys are just going like crazy. And then it overwhelms, and I get a one to one ratio of electrons and holes, which is by the definition intrinsic. So that's question four. <coughs> Question five is, um, I think I confused everybody because problem six I wanted to have as a meteor 25-point uh, problem. So I wanted to have the whole page. So I think a lot of people got confused that problem five, I was looking for a really lengthy answer, and I wasn't. It was only 15 points, same as the first four. So I wasn't looking for this encyclopedia for problem 15. It's essentially drift and diffusion, right? I put carriers in motion. What's in there? It's, it's just free carriers. What are they going to be uh, um, move around your system by? What stimulus? A concentration gradient, which is diffusion, and drift by an electric field. Nothing about that it has to be a PN junction, depletion reagent, none of that. That's, that's, it's neither here nor there because uh, I could put an external field, I can do, you know, do so many things, so many different things. It doesn't, it's not in the context of just those specific in incarnations. It's, it's extremely general. Electric field, drift, concentration gradient, diffusion. Doesn't matter whether it's uh, cookie smells or, or dopants diffusing into your uh, uh, material to make a double diffused bipolar or free electrons or free holes. They all diffuse by a concentration gradient, period. And it's simply by having kinetic energy that they're exchanging, they're, they're, they're moving around, they're doing their Brownian motion type thing, and therefore there is a, p a possibility of an exchange of this guy and this guy switching places. And if they're switching places and they do that enough, then that cookie smell will go hop and hop and hop eventually by diffusion, by a statistically random hop, will eventually go all the way up to your bedroom from the kitchen, right? So it's just that. It's just to give it kinetic energy. Of course, that all stops if it's zero Kelvin. Okay, so I think people agonized over that problem more than you had to. I apologize for that, but I pretty explicit 15 points only. Um, then problem 25 is the big kahuna, that's the how does a PN junction form. Um, and so that's basically, I start off with a concentration gradient, right? I have a P and an N, and maybe I'll lose this. I have a P and an N, and I connect them up. And um, you don't have to necessarily say this in, um, in, in figures, but 
you know, I'd have, say, an N and an N here, and a P sub P here, and so the minority carrier concentration is a P sub N and an N sub P, and so I have a huge concentration gradient. So the concentration gradient is the starting point. And we now know from the previous question that if I have a concentration gradient, things are fused. <coughs> so from that, electrons pile over there, holes pile over there, and of course, as, as the uh, free electrons are leaving the neutral, this came up in this morning's lecture, if they're leaving the neutral n-type material, then, then this no longer becomes neutral, it starts to ionize. So I'm liberating the electrons from the uh, donors, leaving positive charges behind. So I'm opening up the um, opening up the depletion region, right? Creating the electric fields. So then I'm leaving the ionized donors, and then as I'm establishing the electric field from these ionized donors and acceptors. I'm starting to establish the electric field. And it's the, not directly the electric field that's, I, I didn't go into this uh, subtleties um, for uh, scoring, uh, taking points off, but it's not really so much the electric field that's pushing these carriers back and saying, don't come here anymore. It's really that the uh, ionized donors are uh, leading to, through Gauss's law, a band bending. Bands bend accordingly. Maybe I've got a figure that shows that. Um, P and junctions, yes. So then, as I form the, the depletion region, right, it establishes through Gauss's law, there's an electric field, and so the electric field leads to band bending. This is the better one. This is the modular uh, series. It leads to the potential V v of x to bend. So as a result, the band diagram should be there. So then it leads to a band bending, which means the, the barrier induced by the electric field opposes and, and restricts the ability for further diffusion to take place. And so then equilibrium is established where diffusion and drift counterbalance each other, and it's a dynamic equilibrium. Okay. So then, including your answer, then a description of the of the current components. Well, that's a current component. That's a current component. Uh, they're not showing it here, but there's a current component here. There's a current component there. I don't know why they're not showing it. Um, but um, so this drift is, uh, what's the rate limiting step for this drift? Generation? Yes, generation. Generation in or near, right? So this guy, anything that, that falls off that cliff is going to be collected, right? The, the electric field, whether, it's a, whether I'm stepping off a curb or I'm stepping down 10 stories, it's going to be collected. So it's just the availability of these minority carriers. So it's, I'm, I'm waiting generation, it's the generation, so I'm waiting for uh, either a, uh, some heat to, create, to generate a carrier, or I'm waiting for some, um, a photon to be absorbed, that's basically a solar cell. The diffusion is, what's, what's, a whole, uh, what's the rate limiting step for that? Potential barrier. Potential barrier, right? It's the potential barrier we just, we just talked about, it's holding it back. And that is an externally bias dependent barrier, right? Because I can modulate that. And so the same thing goes for the holes. The holes the here are the generation inhibited, and the holes here are barrier inhibited. Okay, and that's it. That's the midterm. Okay, questions? Since we have a live audience for a change. Um, so, um, if you didn't catch the, my drift before, I'm being pretty, pretty open and honest about everything. And so, 
I did this on the board in class, and I know some people don't always come to class, so that's why we're doing this recording. I have been quoted as saying that the uh, final exam will be comprehensive, but weighted towards the new material. So to be up explicit, and I don't want it to be, um, and the other thing I've been quoted as saying is I don't want it to be a marathon. I don't want it to be, um, you know, we normally have six questions in a midterm, and, and that's 55 minutes. Now we're going to have an hour and 55 minutes. So uh, I don't want to make it a timed event. I want to make sure everyone has time to finish. So I've always done this, where instead of doubling the, the number of questions, I only go up by uh, no more than 50% questions. And these are very rigorous to, uh, for me to grade, as you've seen. I apologize for taking so long to get the midterms back. Um, so I'm suggesting eight problems. I think that's palatable in an hour and 55 minutes. They're going to be the same style, same genre, essay-based. So if I uh, follow that formula, that's going to be two questions uh, from midterm two, uh, midterm one, two questions from midterm uh, two, and so, so, so one of your colleagues, one of your classmates asked me, oh, you're going to ask the same question from midterm one? <laughs> like, no, 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 no. From the material that midterm one was based on, okay? Let's, let's uh, be clear on that. And then four for mid for um, the new material. So, uh, you know, two questions from the, the body of material. And, and this, I can, you can probably pretty much predict what Berger, what's in Berger's mind. You're going to probably have one diode application, the two videos that you need to watch, and I've been tracking how many hits there have been, and there haven't been enough. Uh, less than half the class has watched it, so I know that some of you have not. Probably two FPTs and one killer BJT, bipolar junction transistor. Okay, there you go. That's it. Fundamental, you know, fundamentals. You've seen that over and over again. There's no surprises. They're 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 deep, meaningful questions, but they're never something that you're not that we haven't covered. And it's to exhaustion almost. Okay, so just you know, articulate the fundamentals. Questions on that? Okay, so um, midterm one was all the way up. Boy, that seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? Um, midterm one was all the way up to oxidation. Right, that was crystallography. That's going right. Crystallography to oxidation. And then we had uh, quantum mechanics up into diodes, unbiased diodes. Uh, oh, shoot, you know what? I'm not covering. Ah, this just exposed one weakness. I'm not exposing, I'm not covering. Formally, I'm gonna have to rethink this a little bit. Uh, 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 diodes, um, biased diodes. In other words, uh, diodes biased, diodes switching. Right? If you noticed, I spent a lot of time on switching diodes, on-off transients and stuff like that. Um, so somewhere in there, uh, uh, biased and switching. I gotta somehow remedy and reshuffle that a little bit. Yeah, because that's a key, key aspect. Okay, so crystallography and oxidation, I think by now you're starting to see the context, right? See, I'm trying, trying to, to translate um, that, that crystallography, how that's important to the band structure. You <coughs> just saw that, just witnessed that. So I'm trying to make sure that everything we're talking about has some connection to something down the road. Oxidation, what was the big connection there? The oxidation was the fact that, that it translates to a very tame interface state density, and so that you could start to appreciate a little bit more when we go to a deposited high-K dielectric, how innovative that was to get the uh, interface state density under control. Um, 
And diffusion, we've seen how diffusion affects everything. And diffusion, whether it's diffusion of dopants or diffusion of carriers, it's all, in some sense, you can, you can get that a little jumbled in your head, but it also is a very, uh, manifestations of the same thing, of just something going through a concentration gradient. So that allows us to, to, to better understand how a diode you know, turns on and off, and I got diffusion of carriers, uh, and so forth. <coughs> Switching applications and stuff like that. Um, and the quantum mechanics, you see it really comes down to where did the band structure come from? What's the fundamental origin? And being able to understand these currents and everything. Um, so, uh, any specific questions? Yes. Um, the BJT material is pretty hefty, so are we supposed to know everything or just? Um, I would, if if you'll permit me, and you can you, feel free to ask me, but I was not going to go and nauseam through every P, uh, PDF uh, uh, of this material and this material. We've sort of done that before. If you have specific questions, I can come back. But I did want to follow this last question here and kind of scroll through this PD, because this is the new material. I've done the two videos on the diode applications, so I think that stands on its own merit. Um, but I did want to follow what your question is. I actually did want to kind of go through slide by slide and make some commentaries. So if, you, if you're welcome to receptive to that, I'm going to do that right now. And I will get to the bipolars last. So let me just scroll through the FETs, hit the hot points. FETs is, nope, that's not it. FETs. Um, I know this didn't scan very well, but this is the uh, different family of F field effect transistors, FETs. Uh, I guess in some sense sort of know that. Um, by the way, I, maybe this is an overarching um, thing, as I may, I may not ask just, just to make it easier for grading. You see how Herculean it is to grade these things. I may break like what normally might be a, a pretty in-depth, um, uh, meaty question. I may break it up into an A and a B, like smaller one or two sentence things, because because uh, otherwise this is I'm not going to be able to post grades in time, especially for graduating seniors. So recognize I may ask instead of one meaty, you know, two two meaty questions. It may be one meaty question and another one with uh, one two three parts or something like that. Something, and I, and I tend to be sensitive about the the rigor of it and and and, and assign the point value. Okay, so so. Uh, uh, we didn't really cover JFETs, by the way. Um, I kind of blew past that. It does present to you, like I said, because this is not actually manufactured and used in the world, but it's always been a teaching tool for understanding this thing, which I think is a bit of a, a, conf a source of confusion for everyone. And anytime there's a source of confusion, there's also that's also a, uh, opportunity for me to exploit that confusion uh, and so uh, understanding why I get this pinch off you know why is the why is the resistance the variable resistance go up as I'm as I'm adding the VVS voltage and how that arcs over and I get pinch off and the current saturates Okay, so JFET was just a teaching tool. We actually revisited that in the context of the MOSFET. So then you can see how it goes through the family of curves. This is the family of curves. And, and I can hit the different points depending on my gate voltage. Right? So this is a three terminal device, which allows me to hit any one of those. And, and I actually recognize, and someone asked me after class uh, offline, can't I be here? Of course you can be there. I want to make sure that's very, very clear. This is not where the, volt, uh, the, the transistor operates. It operates continuously, right? I could bias at minus 1.5. I could bias the gate at minus 1.2. Uh, that's my choice as an operator to put this anywhere. So I can move this anywhere I want. 
So this is, but this is just showing me the um, the family of curves, and I made a reference if you didn't hear in class that's kind of like looking at a topological map where you see the contours of the different heights. You know, every thousand meters they make a contour. So if you wanna you wanna hike in uh, Nepal or something like that, you know which way to take your uh, pathway to get up the mountain. Okay, that's all it is. Okay, so. So and recognize that in the digital world, I've been trying to emphasize this a little bit more, we're toggling between cutoff and saturation. And that allows us to go from two extremes for the digital. Oops. So then here's the equations to go with that. Yeah, we didn't uh, go through derivations as much uh, for the uh, classes. Uh, here is the... Um, the idea of velocity saturation, in, uh, and, and so this is that Felix Baumgartner side of scenario that I'm going to hit, and there's going to be a, a, a limit to how fast I can push an electron through this crystal with all of its issues, and the speed limit is usually around one, in silicon, one times 10 to the seven centimeters per second. Uh, does, carriers do not go through the speed of light. I hope you know that. Uh, uh, that's 10 to the 10 centimeters per second, correct me if I'm wrong, I think, yes. So that's three orders of magnitude uh, slower than light. And so when you have that, you end up with this family of curves. You can see how it's equidistant, so that means I have constant gain. It's kind of uh, saturated. Uh, so it's equally spaced curves, meaning the gain between those is uh, the same. The gain is, is uniform. Um, so the gallium arsenide MESFET, mm, didn't talk about that as much, I guess. Uh, do understand this, though. This is how the mobility droops with more carriers. So <coughs> where I'm trying to tie this in, let me tie this in just a little more elegantly for this review. GM. GM is, I'm always kind of coming back to harping about, that's the, that's the gain of the, the, the field effect transistor. And that is essentially a delta IDS over a delta VGS, right? So electrostatically, this is why I need to have a, a very small voltage. You know, I want to I have that high capacitance, I wanna, because I want to be able to use a small voltage to, to modify a large current. Okay. Um, so to modify this large current, then if I have a large number of carriers in my channel, I can um, I will be modulating a larger current. So this is a problem because this gra these graphs tell me that I cannot have my cake and eat it too. This means that if I put a lot of carriers into the channel by doping it highly, then my mobility sags. <coughs> so the more I put in, the slower they go. Big problem. That's why the innovation of the mod FET, that, that, uh, which I think comes up here, yes, by having the band offsets of a hetero junction, where the hetero junction, the way the gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide, or what we often just say gas algas, that this particular, um, this is just an, uh, a, a blow up of the conduction band. And you can see this triangular potential well basically dips below the water line, below the Fermi level. So therefore, this triangle is a sheet of charge. And the doping was way over here. So that's why I tend to prefer the term modulation doping, a mod fit, because the, the carriers actually transfer and the scattering, the impurity scattering we would normally get is now divorced from the, the where they are actually moving. <coughs> so this device allows me to have my cake and eat it too. This is what you're going to see a lot up in satellites, for communication satellites. When you want to watch the ball game and it's being televised, it's the 49ers, and it's got to be, be beamed up to San Francisco to a satellite and then back down to Columbus. Well, I'm pretty sure they have uh, some mod fets up in the satellite that are going to be helping process and rebroadcast that signal back down. Okay. 
Um, yes, question. So the question uh, was uh, on the previous uh, slide. You said that when you dope, the courier is highly, mm -hmm. it slows the mobility. Yes. You know, so that's in the context of a conventional FET. And so this is a whole different type of a field effect transistor. Right? We have a whole family of different effects. That's what, I, that's what uh, this very first slide is. I have junction field effect transistors. I have metal semiconductor field effect transistors. I have metal insulator semiconductor field effect transistors. I have what the traditional MOSFET. That's the ones that have interface state densities and things like that problems. Uh, and here's the mod, mod FET, the one I'm just talking about. It's a whole different, and it says confines the charge in a channel and reduces scattering in the channel, high mobility, also called a hemp, versus these others that are just um, the, the gate oxide on the channel. The gate, gate and the you know, oxide. Yes? Why does pitch on occur again as you increase uh, let me go to the MOSFET. Uh, well, yeah, let me go to the MOSFET. That's a good question. Uh, let me, well, yeah, let me, uh, this, this is kind of, so, so as you're going through the family of curves, as you're going up, this is your inversion layer on the MOSFET. Yeah, this is a MOSFET, okay. So the inversion layer is, um, so right here, I'm kind of just, just coming up, and so I have that VGS, I have the VGS, I have the gate bias, right, and it's created the, inver it's induced an inversion channel, right, and so, um, but now the the VDS, the voltage between these guys, orthogonal to it, is actually just at the beginning. So I'm, so I'm here. And so the inversion channel is well established all continuously across the channel. So then the tangent to that is a very high, uh, a low resistance, very sharp. Now as I bias up VDS, then you can see that the, the influence of the other electric field coming from the orthogonal direction attenuates the, the inversion layer. So it sort of narrows and eventually I lose inversion at a certain point. And so that's making, inhibiting the carrier flow. So if I think when I'm out here, I'm going to have a, a steeper tangent to it a higher resistance because of that. And then as I get here, where I'm actually to the point of uh, pinch off, then, um, then you can see the tangent is gonna be very, so I kind of stitch these guys together and I get the family, uh, you know, the, the one curve. And I stitch these together and this is pinching off. So then we say this loci um, of, of points. So this is where saturation occurs, and beyond that, it should be fairly flat. Okay. Um, so then, the MOS capacitor is a very good foundational material as to understanding the band diagram, how it lines up. I'm gonna be left with this being able to be modulated and uh, inducing eventually the inversion layer. And one thing I like to always emphasize is recognize that the inversion layer is buffered by the depletion layer, right? I was talking to one of your colleagues today after class, right? Yes. And so recognize that that inversion layer has a sheath around it. Yeah, this one I think is the one I used. And so, that inversion layer, that band bending, right? The bands bend up to there. So if I bring that down, that's right there. This, this rectangle here is systemic to the depletion. 
So the first thing that happens is I bring this, bend this band down by, by pulling it down with the voltage on the gate is I'm pushing the holes away. But when this intrinsic layer drops below the, um, uh, uh, the, when the Fermi level basically pops above the intrinsic layer, then I induce the inversion channel. So I have two sets of charges from two different origins. I have fixed ionized acceptors convolved with the free electrons. So the fixed ionized acceptors have a negative charge. And so that's a rectangle. And they're not moving. But the, but the inversion channel is, is where the carriers are. Inversion channels. So there's a sheet, just like that mod fit. I have a triangle, quantum well triangle. A triangular, uh, yeah, uh, a triangular quantum well, let's phrase it that way, of charge. And essentially, it's basically grabbed, even though this is P type material. It's grabbed every electron it can lay its hands on in the vicinity and neighborhood. Put it in there, essentially. Okay. Um, so, inversion. So, conditions for inversion, right, was when this thing came down and it was uh, phi f, when this thing bent down to be this. When this got to be here, we said that it hit threshold. So it was 2 phi f. That was a condition for strong inversion, or basically in, in words, it would be that the surface is as n-type as the bulk is. This is bulk, undepleted bulk. I know it's undepleted because it's flat. Undeple uh, the, uh, as, 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 as the bulk is p-type. So, yeah, we talked about, uh, yeah, CV, profiling, so forth. You got the two different capacitances in series. And so as they go through, the one kicks on, and I get uh, the overall capacitance dropping. And under uh, high frequency or low frequency, I can get the different curves. Um, and that, that is really, show, uh, can illustrate to us where the threshold voltage is too, by the way, when that channel turns on. So you can see here's the different uh, frequencies, high frequency, low frequency, how the, the um, if I'm doing low frequency, the carriers that are uh, occurring in that channel, in that inversion channel, can be uh, generated or recombined at a rate faster than this 10 hertz. 10 hertz is obviously very, very slow. So generation recombination can happen so quickly that this, this low frequency measurement that the, the inversion channel um, carriers actually are um, uh, masked and they kind of essentially disappear, so it pops back up. So non-ideal, we talked about the phi MS using different work functions for the gate. And so I think what's really important is that you know, this is, this is uh, we're going to convolve this, that the flat band voltage is basically the voltage to, to erase. This is the different phi M and phi S. What this is trying to show is phi M and phi S are not equal. So um, if I don't put any bias on it, it actually bends. So it bends without a bias. There's no gate voltage here. Because notice, the Fermi level is flat. Fermi level. <coughs> No bias. So the fact that the work function of the metal is different than the semiconductor caused it to bend. So therefore, I want to go back to that original starting point where everything's flat. So we're saying that the voltage to bring it back to this flat condition is the voltage to get there, flatten that all out, is the flat band voltage. So in that particular case, I need to add the difference in the two work functions, phi ms, to erase that differential. That's a differential that carries forward. Now there's a second term, what this doesn't show, and the second term is, of course, the interface state charge, Q. So actually, these two terms in the threshold voltage, the phi ms and the qi over ci, are the two terms that also are referred to as the flat band voltage. 
These are the, the bad guys, the guys that are because of the permutations of the, of the real world. These are the guys that are in the idealized world, right? I have the QD, the depletion capacitance, that rectangle, and I have the condition for strong inversion, 2 phi F. These two last two terms are always there for the ideal case, and these two terms appear for the real world case. And, and QI has these menagerie of four different sources of charge, right? Mobile ionic, oxide trapped, oxide fixed, the one I've made you worry about, interface trap charge, and that's because it's right where the channel is, so that's always the most, uh, one of the more problematic ones. So, you can see, and so you can see how the CV profile sloshes back and forth with the hysteresis of the mobile ions. Um, and yeah, so this graphically shows those four terms for the threshold voltage. So threshold voltage is very important, right? How do I physically realize these different things? How do I perhaps, this is um, tunneling kind of high voltage, high, high conditions. Um, yeah, so essentially transconductance, delta I over delta VG. So you can see it's, it's got some geometry parameters, the Z over L ratio. It has the mobility, it has the capacitance C, C sub I, and the threshold voltage. So um, I can get a better trans, uh, mutual transconductance, bigger gain by increasing the CI. That's why we need to keep making the oxide uh, thinner and thinner and thinner. And uh, so you can see. Uh, here's the question in the MOSFET uh, term. He actually just left, but the pinch off of a MOSFET, this is a better rendering of it, uh, where you see the depletion region. And so you get this, this sharp slope, very low resistance. As it bends over, the depletion region is starting to form. It bends over, and then you get pinch off. And it's fairly stabilized. Okay. Yeah, so here's the locus of points, family of curves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, and then this is the P MOS versus the N MOS, right? And so they're actually you know, inversions of it, complements of each other. And then as I change and move the, uh, the maximum gain point around, I can actually move it from an, a normally on norm, uh, to normally off. I can hit these different permutations. Wait, normally off, sorry, I misread that. Normally off, normally on, normally off, normally on for P and N. So I have four different permutations as a circuit designer in my bag of tools. Um, yeah, here's the transfer characteristics, maximum GM. So that's the bias point. If I wanted to make an amplifier, that'd be a beautiful place to uh, bias it for amplification. And then here's the usable current I would get with that amplification. And yeah, um, yeah so there's the NMOS, PMOS. And so we've always been looking, you know, at the interface state density and the thinness of the gate oxide and, and uh, if, if there's any one of those stories I related that's sort of like uh, current events type topics it's the usage of a high K dielectric I really understand that story uh, I, I, I labored on that many many times so I think that's testable material um, we talked about it and, and you know recognize it's one of your OSU distinguished OSU alums you should know that story um, so control of threshold voltage right so if I have the pro so you know I, I, I'm sure I'm gonna go there somewhere it's either what can control the threshold voltage you know what determines the sets the threshold voltage any one of those four terms and then how can I uh, engineer, right? We're engineers, how can I engineer that to be different? What knobs do I have to turn? Well, this is really important because these are my four terms in my equation. So what do I have to change? Well, I could change phi ms by changing the, what the gate is. 
I can change C sub I by doing some things there with gate oxides. <laughs> um, I can do ion implantation to, to offset the interface state traps by implanting. Um, these are all knobs. I can do substrate bias, probably less elegant, but I actually put a fourth terminal and bias the substrate from behind, and it, it uh, uh, modulates the depletion region. Uh, this is not one of the deviations from ideality so much as our I mean, control of threshold voltage, but it's that self-aligned MOSFET where we do the implantation. And if I put, yeah, so then your, your ion implanting and the gate, the, the polysilicon gate acts as a, as, a, as a marker and the ion implantation <laughs> follows the sidewall of that so it becomes self-aligned. So not only am I uh, uh, changing the threshold voltage, but it actually makes this beautiful self-aligned transistor. So that's starting to get, yeah, here's, here's the thing where it's self-aligned index is right there. So then the stores in the drain are beautifully indexed to the uh, gate. And I avoid all that excess capacitance with that overlap. And so you can see here some of that. So uh, <coughs> I didn't talk in great length about this. It might be more of a graduate level because this segues into tunneling field effect transistors and things. But you know the fact that the diffusion current, that one question I talked about in the, in the, um, in the midterm, where the carriers are essentially, so the fact that the carriers don't all start at once, I don't have all the carriers at the ground state, means that when I start to turn that transistor on through diffusion, there's a delay in way, where, when it turns on from the, from the density of states. Diffusion current is always going to be a manifestation of that. And that means my subthreshold slope is going to be no better than 60 millivolts per decade. This happens to be 70. So that means that uh, diffusion driven FET is, um, is always going to have a modest subthreshold slope. But if I change this to a, the source and make a tunnel junction there, which is that's a graduate level concept uh, and something we're work, we were working on for a while, um, I can overcome that. I can overcome the speed limit. Um, so yeah, you start to see the rendering of the MOSFET and how I can think of this as the basis of the heart of this being a, a GM, that G GM, the, the, the gain I'm always talking about, that is the, um, the gain, it's a voltage controlled uh, current source, so it's GM times VG, should, this should be uh, the, the, tri uh, the trapezoid, right? Uh, instead of the circle, if we're consistent with our linear circuit theory. And then I have capacitances and resistances all dotted around that uh, bring the uh, transistor into more uh, proper rendering. So MOSFET scaling, we see how you can have things that as you make things smaller, the carriers get hotter and hotter, higher kinetic energy. They walk up the EK diagram, so when carriers come in, they can actually implant right into the oxide, leading to um, uh, problems. And we can, and I didn't really have time to go on to drain, bar induced barrier lowering, things like that. But you know, recognize not to great degree, but just recognize there's an electrostatic coupling when you get small. That um, what you're doing on the source. Uh, yeah, that what you're doing over the, as you bring the, and make the device small, thinner, sh um, shorter and shorter and shorter, that what you're doing on the source is now influencing the drain. They're actually no longer independent of each other. And it's just, you can just imagine electrostatics, right? As I bring things closer and closer together, there's an electrostatic interaction between the source and the drain. And so that lowers the barrier and so there's a lot of leakage basically is what it's saying. So it, it, it gets leaky. And we didn't talk about that in great length because of time sakes. Yeah, and then this is where I started to, this is not the foundational material when I started talking about the inverter. I was just trying to give you some context of why I care about all this, uh, where it's being used. Well, once, once I have the P channel and the N channel 
So then I can make inverters. These become building blocks and everything. Right, so here's the inverter. And then I kind of just gave you a whole bunch of eye candy, essentially, for how this is actually used with DRAM and FETs and, uh, and the more, more classic NMOS, PMOS with the tubs. Um, and here you can see, and so I can actually make something that is a value. I can put it on a silicon on insulator so that this isn't electrostatically tied. So I'm putting it, basically building my transistors on a layer of glass. Uh, IBM tends to do that. It's called SOI, silicon insulator. And this is a thin film transistor. This is the basis of the transistors that, uh, so it's deposited on glass. And that's the basis of all your flat panel displays, your cell phones and your pockets right now, that your girlfriend's calling you right now, they're messaging you. Um, so that has thin film transistors driving every pixel. This flat panel display here has a, has a thin film transistor for every pixel, every pixel, right? And how many of these things have? You know, if it's high def, it's a lot of pixels, right? So they're deposited amorphously on, on quartz. Sometimes then they're laser annealed to sort of foster them to go from amorphous and recrystallize uh, to uh, polycrystalline, so the mobility goes up. So then the FET gets more effective, right? It can carry more current if the mobility goes up. And so, yeah, so here's DRAM, right? The trench capacitor idea. So, and uh, this is st static random access memory, six transistors. And that's what's the cache memory co-located with your microprocessor. And this is the flash memory concept, right, where you have a floating gate. Sometimes this is actually just a bunch of little silicon nanoparticles. And you tunnel, you actually tunnel at a high voltage. You'll have a higher voltage to pr uh, programming voltage. And you actually quantum mechanically tunnel charge onto those nanoparticles. And those nanoparticles will hold that charge for a, for a fairly long time, but not infinitum. You know, when, you're, when, you're, when you have grandkids, that, that flash memory is erased, I can tell you that. It's not going to last that long. So store your precious data on magnetic. Uh, it's not, flash is not going to hold it. Uh, yeah, MESFETs and so forth. MESFETs may actually be in your cell phones for some of the transmitters because they make a lot of nice microwave power or low noise amplifiers. And this is starting to look like a real uh, sophisticated microprocessor, right? Where I've got a whole hierarchy, uh, a whole zoo, if you will, of transistors, NMOS, PMOS, and then I got this um, uh, just series of roads. I've got my my city roads. I have my uh, cross across the city roads. I know when I was in Romania and the Philippines, they were starting to they're so congested. They're starting to do these. Raised uh, India should do it too. Uh, should, are these raised highways above the city? So if you want to cross the city without going through the congestion, um, you would go you go up one level, go up a ramp, and go over the top. So you do the you know down with the rickshaws down here, and you'd be up here with the uh, across city, and then you get into the 315, and then you get the I270, and so forth. You know, and you move up the food chain, right? So I don't mean to pick on you. Um, and so that's, that's FETs. And then the last one is the bipolars. And so what I like to do is to emphasize that essentially it's the, it's think of, let's go back, strip it down to its basics. Strip it down to a reverse bias PN junction. The base collector is reverse biased. And, and I've agonized, I made you agonize over the fact that the carriers coming into there were the ones that were generated near it, right? And I could either photo induce chart generation by a solar cell or a photodiode, but here, what if I could throw uh, carriers into the vicinity of that reverse bias PN junction? 
by the proximity of a forward bias PN junction. And that's all it is. It really, that's all it is. So don't get lost in the noise. And so, essentially, <coughs> I have a reverse bias. Now, this is unbiased, so this is not uh, quite fair. But I'm going to have a reverse bias base collector, this PN junction. And when I reverse bias it, this uh, uh, forward bias PN junction <coughs> will throw carriers over here across the neutral base that I was emphasizing in this morning's lecture. <coughs> and that's also unbiased. So then let's go to this one. So under reverse bias, I mean under bias, and this is usually a lot of times they use the PNP, which I know is counterintuitive. It's not, uh, it's not as easy for you to visualize because we're really having to mostly think about the holes. And remember, you've got to stand on your head to think about the holes. So now this guy is forward biased. So the barrier, let's chuck down. The barrier here for the holes has now been shrunk because this was forward biased. So now more of these uh, carriers through the density of states, through the density of states and the Fermi position of them, more of them are revealed to circumnavigate and be injected into the neutral base. And, the, and this is reverse bias, so the barrier used to be modest, but now it's here, so the holes are, are being uh, uh, collected by a strong electric field. And this reverse bias. So the holes that pass here, are basically, once they get to the depletion, they're basically the strong electric field is going to collect them. So this is, in some sense, the finish line. It really has to get to the external world, but by all intents and purposes, this is field is strong enough that if they get to that point, then this red rover effect, you know, you're basically in, 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 in out of harm's way, and you're going to be swept to the collector. So we, what we have to worry about is what's happening in the neutral base. As those holes are going across, how many of them are going to recombine with the electrons? Question. Um. When it goes from P to N in, love, in the forward bias, it goes because of diffusion, right? Diffusion, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's a diffusion current, which is driven by the density of states and availability of carriers. I'm going to wear that shade down, out. And so, yeah, this is maybe a better rendering of it. It's a little cleaner. The holes uh, come across, diffusing. Circumnavigating, one 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 of those three was lost due to recombination, but two made it across the red rover zone, and you can see that's a strong enough field on this reverse bias. So this is this is where the transistor is operating here for amplification, right? When I get down here, this is the cutoff. And when I'm up here, I'm in saturation, right? So the cutoff was where the, um, uh, the two uh, PN junctions are actually reverse biased. Up here, the two PN junctions are forward biased. <coughs> but we're gonna, we start off our discussion talking about the normal bipolar, where it's that bias. Forward on the emitter and reverse on the collector. So you can see the wish list really, really speaks to the fundamental physics. So that's a that's a that's a tip. That's that's a that's a suggestion. Wish list. I need almost all the holes injected into the base to be collected. So I need the base narrow. I want very few recombining. So I want tau to be large. Right. That was the conundrum that came up this morning. If I really want a high frequency de device, I want a dope the base highly to reduce its base resistance, but that's going to kill tau p. So that heterojunction device allowed us to, you know, have our cake and eat it too, to recycle one of those terms I used. So we want the neutral base to be much, much less than the diffusion length. I need almost all the current in the emitter crossing to be the holes. Now this is under the scenario, I'm assuming we're still talking about a PNP. 
I've got to switch that to uh, electrons if I switch to an NPN, so just be careful about that. Um, so, um, so therefore, I doped the, the emitter more heavily than the base, the P plus. This is the one no one got this morning, this morning's lecture. No one. Even the guys that got 100%. So uh, the base current is consisted of three current components. Some of them are stronger, some of them are weaker, the, probably the world. stronger one is the resupply electrons lost to recombination. Right? So every hole that's going across and gets tackled is tackled by an electron, so they both lose their life. It's an electron-hole pair. And so they, they annihilate each other. The electrons injected in the emitter, those are the guys that are going backwards that I don't want. We call them back injected often. They're the ones I don't want. Um, and then we have that small, small, small uh, electron current. Let me go back. There's a better diagram for that. Uh, where is it now? Maybe the other direction, sorry. Yeah. So that third little current component is this, and that is the generation current near the reverse bias pn junction, which we know is, is limited by the generation rate. And so that's small. So you can see this is vectorially correct. Pretty high uh, uh, recombination, meeting the electrons. Electron hole pairs annihilate each other. This is the back injected electrons. This is probably the second strongest. And the weakest is these guys, the generation current uh, around the basis collector. OK. And here's another rendering by a diff different author. And so this is what I was talking about when I talked about emitter injection efficiency this morning, when I was talking about heterojunctions. It's the ratio of the holes from the emitter uh, over the total current of the emitter, the electrons uh, the, the holes and the electrons. So if the electrons back injecting the emitter was zero, then the emitter injection efficiency would basically be unity. And base transport factor is basically the collector current over the emitter hold current. We want that to be unity, so it's, <coughs> but it's, uh, if there's holes lost to recombination, then B uh, goes less than zero. And then you multiply the two to get this alpha, and essentially gain is alpha over one minus alpha. That's your beta. Beta is the, is the um, uh, amplification factor. In fact, if I can zip forward, I'm slide 15 now, so I have a long way to go, I'm sorry. But uh, when I was showing you these gummel plots, I didn't give it a name this morning. Where is it? Yeah. When I've shown you these gummel plots, this is the beta. We're plotting the log of IB uh, and the log of IC on the same curve. So this is, this is the IB and this is the IC in versus out. And this is a function of the voltage between the emitter and the base. And so the ratio there is the beta dc. So the farther on this, this is called a gummel plot, the farther these are apart, the more the gain is. And so that is exactly slide 15, that, right, IC over IB. So I just showed you how that graphically how we look at that. Um, so how do we get amplification? This is where, this is also another rich story for, for fodder for exploration and exam, is somehow understanding how I actually get gain when I'm sending all these holes out of the emitter and I'm collecting fewer of them in the collector, yet I'm trying to, to hand wave that I'm actually getting gain. Doesn't make much sense on face value, so you need to understand that. Um, and, rec and so understanding how the electrostatics of the whole system tie together, and so basically that small electron current in the base controls the large hole current. When you understand that, then you start to realize 
how they're tied together through that electrostatics, and that becomes the gain. And I can actually get uh, more um, uh, extrapolate that even one step further and it's related to these two time constants. To the first principles, the gain is related to the tau p over tau t. So do look at that. So, you know, understand how you actually get gain. Uh, let's blow past this. Some of that's redundant. We talked about double diffused. Uh, so yeah, it's a little bit finer point. Oh, these are all the um, these are all the setup equations. I think my, I'm not sure this is recording me oh, with the camera here, but um, these are the setup equations for the Ebers mole equations. And so I'm not going to make you know all those equations, right? The, I'm giving you essay-based <coughs> exams. If we had time, I would have given you a homework assignment to do that at home, but unfortunately. We, uh, unfortunately for us, we didn't do that. Fortunately for you, you didn't have to agonize over that. But essentially, just bringing this into the f context that it really is just simply two diodes. Two diodes. And that's what Ebers Mole uh, uh, recognized. And so by, by an analysis of that, we get the terminal currents, the emitter collector base, it's essentially uh, expressed as as these two diodes. And forward, this is the one that's active, and uh, no, and forward, this is the one active, and in reverse, this is the one that's active. So this is always that reverse saturation current is always chugging along, but it's usually overwhelmed when this guy turns on, right? And so these are the the Ebers mole, where I'm just saying two diodes. So this is kind of like a spice model, right? And so I actually go through that one there all. I have a nice killer diagram somewhere. Yeah. So then those two diodes turn off, and I'm only left with those reverse saturation components. So that other, that other um, diode, that, that, that turned off and disappeared. Right. Technically, they should show that and show it going to zero. So I'm left with the reverse saturation, so then this becomes the charge in the neutral base. And when they're both on, I hope I have that figure. When they're both on, please help me. Hey, it's not showing. When they're both on, then Apologize, I hope I'm not confusing you. When they're both on, um, then it, it comes up and, and I get. So then this kind of is a segue into that switching aspect where you're going from you know, so this guy comes down to the, the reverse saturation, so if it's off. So, and this is, this triangle is formed by the forward biased emitter. And remember, we're assuming that it is P plus NP. So I assume that this is a stronger diode than this one. So if the emitter has, has more doping, it's stronger, then it's going to send in more charge to the neutral base. And the collector, if that was four biased in that saturation mode, it's going to send current, but it's going to send it at a lesser rate. So I get two triangles. So in saturation, this is it. This is the minimum of the saturation. Uh, I mean, this is the, the emitter uh, four bias, and this is the collector, and this is the summation of the two. So, we end up with this uh, other substory is the switching, and uh, it could be going in the wrong direction. I apologize. Let me see here in a second. Uh, yeah, no, this is what I'm looking for. So then I can go between edge of saturation, which probably means I'm maybe somewhere like up in here. And as I go further into oversaturation, I'm just over pushing it and putting this extra charge here on the neutral base. 
And so then that the harder I push this here, the harder it's going to be to take that charge away and push it back down to cutoff where they're both reverse biased. So as a digital switch, that extra charge is problematic. So that's why we were talking about the uh, charge control model somewhere here. We had charge control model <coughs> talking about the cues. I thought I passed by that uh, switching. Uh, basically, it's the could be could be going in the wrong direction again. Yeah, I am. Yeah, so Q. It's so QB. Uh, I think the, um, the modular series on Reserve of the Library does a really good job. I think that's a better explanation to look at that. And so you're basically trying to get rid of that QB, the charge. And, but it's a very similar argument to the charge control. Yeah, this is what I like. Yeah, I like this. This is a good explanation because you're going from the two reverse biased cutoff to both forward biased oversaturation and everything in between. So I'm just adding and subtracting that charge, and this is the waveform that manifests. So this is what's happening with the charge QB, and this is what's happening in the collector current. And so if you understand that, then you understand why the collector has a delay, a time delay from when it actually turns on from its stimulus. So this is what comes in the base, and the collector comes out so many tau seconds later. Uh, there's, a, there's a delay. And so you can see all that. Yeah, so it really stems down to this is the, this is the killer uh, differential equation. I'm not having you solve it, but it's basically the charge in that neutral base, time dependency, is dependent upon these two parameters. So I can either put charge in with a, with a base current, or I can take charge out QB through recombination. Those are my only two valves. Put it in. By four biasing, I take it out, and I have to wait so many time <coughs> constants. So I'm really at the mercy of recombination to turn that transistor off. Unless I do one of those cute um, things, such as the diode, sh uh, shocky diode clamp that I talked about this morning's class. This might be a even better rendering. I didn't talk about this too much, but this kind of shows it similarly. Active saturation cut off, even inverted. You can go through and it shows you the carrier concentration. So cut off, both are reverse biased, hardly any charge in the neutral base. Active, this is forward biased, but this is reverse. Saturation, both forward biased, both, dump, both dumping in charge. Yeah, this is a, this, I should have shown this a little bit more. That's a pretty good rendering. That's from Simon, a little Z. And yeah, so here you can see. That's the amount of charge, QB. I keep talking about QB, that's the QB. And yeah, here's the, here's the toggling between cutoff and saturation. And oversaturation, this is the edge of saturation. So you can see how this goes through. Edge of saturation might be here. Be here, where this just comes up. And then this is the oversaturation, so I push it for even <coughs> further. And I don't have, never, more, uh, shouldn't have to. Okay, so then the last things I think I talked about today, <coughs> these are the transients, a lot of detail, but understand the physics. <sighs> that shocky diode clamp inhibited it to get, to, to build up so much charge. That was this morning's lecture, actually. And so we are getting to the end, towards the end. I always uh, tried to relate to your project one, the double diffused bipolar, the drift in the base, leading to a small uh, drift-aided diffusion. All right, so the, by the doping variation, the bands actually are tilted without any bias, without any bias, they're tilted. So it gives a, a little bit of a push and oops, 
drift aided diffusion. Yeah, I already talked about that. Early effect, right? <coughs> Otherwise known as base width modulation, as you bias the collector, it encroaches on the neutral base. So essentially, the, the Red Rover effect, the distance I have to do to, 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 to navigate, to cross, to get uh, to the edge of the collector, is shorter. So therefore, actually, as I bias it more, I get more current because fewer of them are getting annihilated as they cross. It's really, that's all it is. It's the forward bias or reverse biasing to get This is as you're, because this is minus VCE. It's actually done on purpose. So actually, as I'm pushing this farther, uh, the base collector is actually getting more reverse biased. It's actually opening up. So this is, yeah, so this is a short uh, base collector medium and large. So you can see that uh, as, it, as it, take, and it takes away from the base. And then the last, was it the last? Oh, I guess two more things was the, um, uh, the emitter crowding effect that I talked about today, that you have this distributed resistance. And so it's really the perimeter. If you look at that, it's just basically looking at the geometry and you see that the emitter is actually going to be modestly forward biased more than the than in the center, and so from that the perimeter is the one that's contributing the current, and so therefore if I really want to make a device that that has a lot of power, I want to interdigitate it so that it's all the edges, all the accumulated edges. So I have all these edges, and every one of those edges is contributing to that bipolar, and I have a lot of it, but if I didn't spread it out like that, that current would be so hot that the device would break down. But by, by making lots of edges, I can keep the current to be a tame amount and it won't burn itself up. So this can be a power device, can handle uh, amps. And so we go back to the Gummel plot, showing the beta. And then the last, last thing was heterojunctions. Heterojunctions allows me to have a good emitter injection efficiency because I get all my electrons coming across with very few holes because it's got a dissimilar barrier. Then allows me to dope this highly so I can drop my base resistance and I can get a really high frequency device. And there was that one diagram, yeah. These are starting to look like your real working devices with the graded and then here they showed where they actually changed the alloy composition. So by changing the alloy composition, it has the same net effect as that old school prehistoric double diffused bipolar ad you calculate. Because no one makes, no one sells that commercially. But, it, but the effect you get from it is actually um, uh, <coughs> teaches us something. So that's what they do here. They grade the, the composition in the base and it has the same net effect. But that ends up being, uh, uh, high-speed device. So what creates the spike? Um, that's going back. You have to look at the Anderson model of how you draw a, uh, a band diagram. And so you have that delta EC and delta EV, and the only way to stitch those guys together is to end up having that notch, that discontinuity. And so that's obviously inhibits electron flow. So they we grade it, we change the alloy composition as it goes through there so it's not so hyper abrupt. So if we smear it, essentially smear it, we can, we can tame that and, and um, uh, get it away. Uh, and that's basically it. Yeah, so that's, that's really, like I said in this morning's lecture, this is pretty much the silicon germanium bipolar that Vermont, that IBM builds up in their Vermont factory for their bi CMOS chips. And uh, here's a nice uh, bipolar uh, using three fives. Again, modest electric field by the band bending. Huge disparity between the electron injection and hole back injection. And so that's it. You've mastered 3030. <laughs> You're ready to enter graduate school. Okay. Questions? Comments? I have a question in the diode. Yes, diode applications or diode? The diode, like the ideal, 
difference between real diode and real diode and the the deviation. Oh, from okay. I'm gonna draw that first. So again, the way I like to do it is think of it as I V and I is I not X V K T minus one. And so this is minus I not. And then if I do the real diode. Break. Actually, that too. And this. this. All right. So, which arrow do you want to be <laughs> discuss? Uh, on the in the first quadrant, the second, third, and the fourth arrow. Wait. In the first quadrant, like in the, the first quadrant. Yeah. The second, third, and fourth arrows. Second, third, and fourth. Okay. So this one, what I was going to say is because of the cut-in voltage, <coughs> um, this is uh, the diffusion current is inhibited. So the PN junction is still kind of like it's reverse biased, in that the only current really flowing is the drip <coughs> current uh, through generation. Generation, the way to remember this is generation or recombination is a two carrier phenomenon. So therefore, N equals two for that ideality factor, because I'm going to later put um, N on this. There, N. Or no, 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 N is here. Uh, N, ideality factor. And this is going to be uh, uh, N equals one, more or less more or less, probably really realistically like 1.02 if I have a really good diode. And then this will become n equals 2. So this is, has a lot of uh, related to generation recombination because the diffusion is, is delayed. <coughs> and so at the cut-in voltage, that's when I actually get past this. Right, so there's a you know as the bands bend, and I'm looking for that sweet spot of where the carriers really are, and the bands have to bend a certain amount, maybe on the order of two thirds of the band gap. Remember, for silicon this is 0.7, often cut in voltage, so I have to get to something like two thirds of the band gap before these carriers are revealed. So this has a lot of generation recombination is the dominant, just because the diffusion is 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 muzzled. There's very little diffusion. Then this kicks in. Diffusion starts to do what it's supposed to be doing. So this is diffusion dominated. So then ideality factor does what it's supposed to do. It goes to one. This is one a single carrier goes across. Here is where I have high injection. This is where I've got an army of electrons going this way, I've got an <coughs> army of holes coming this way, and they're so plentiful now, it's a, it's a, it's a riot. These things are, are annihilating each other as they go past each other. Over down here at the small um, uh, current densities, they basically are two ships passing on the uh, Pacific Ocean or so forth. They, you know, they hardly uh, see each other. It's like Life of Pi. I just watched Life of Pi last weekend, right? And everybody passes by, no one sees you. But here it's high injection, and so that you're you're being annihilated. And here, of course, is kind of self-explanatory. It's just a failure. Things gotten so hot because now the resistance is kicking in so so highly that I get a serious resistance. So I'm actually the device is literally getting hot as I get up here, and eventually it's going to burn. And sometimes on our in our lab, we have a microscope when we're doing measurements, and if you're paying attention, I also have a CCD camera and a, and a TV screen, you can actually see if you over-bias the device, you'll actually see a puff of smoke. 
and you'll look down and you'll see this black smudge. Um, and so this is just failure. So, does that answer your question? That happens because of overbiasing, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're getting, what you're doing is you're getting the, the diode, you know, you have your, 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 your diode, but you also have finite resistance due to the resistances through the device. Ohmic contacts, the bulk resistance and everything. And <coughs> so then you have the voltage drop across the diode, but you also have V equals IR across this finite resistance. And as the current is getting higher and higher and higher, the resistance is, you know, th this voltage drop is getting higher and higher. So it pushes the curve over, walks over, as V equals IR is, is being added to the diode. And, and then this resistance is actually variable. It's not finite. Because as it gets hotter, right, it's getting a hot, it literally gets a hot foot as you're doing this. So literally, the resistance is actually going up as it gets hotter. So you get basically a thermal runaway. It's like a nuclear meltdown. The resistance gets hotter, which triggers more resistance, which triggers it to roll over faster, and you get this roll-off effect. So that's why you, know, you saw what we did with the power bipolar. I want to interdigitate it. I need to keep the current density tame, or these resistances blow up in your face. I have some students now. Uh, some undergrads, actually, this summer we're going to try and make some uh, devices where we need we need to do this also. And we were trying to get up to 100 gigahertz with some of that uh, millimeter wave sensing. If you saw that poster outside my uh, office, we're trying to hit some 100 gigahertz kind of cutoff frequencies. So we need to keep very tolerable resistances. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, you didn't talk about uh, metal semiconductor junctions. Ah, yes. Uh, that is important because it comes up. Uh, metal semiconductor junctions is the question. Metal semiconductor junctions. Schottky diodes is, are actually a very valid type of diode because of its majority carrier. So you don't have the char all that charge storage that we worry about in the PN junction kind of disappears with the PN with the metal semiconductor junctions. And and I kind of got a little rushed about that in the in the diode applications, but that's one of the reasons I was studying that myself as a um, for diode applications. That was one of the reasons I was actually making these metal, semiconductor metal uh, photodiodes. This has very low, low charge storage, and so I can actually get a very fast. So these have been clocked up to 500 gigahertz, for instance. So if I want to make a really high speed uh, optical interconnect, this is actually very uh, useful. So this is one of the things I was working on. But metal semiconductor, so we've you've seen it actually. It comes up, metal semiconductor is a, is a gallium arsenide MESFET, which is probably in your cell phone, your low noise amplifier. It came up in that diode, uh, in the, sorry, the bipolar when we did the Schottky diode clamp that kept the base from, um, from um, building up too much charge. It siphoned off the excess charge, so we did a Schottky diode clamp. Um, we can use it here for this. Uh, it's, it's an easy way to make a diode. So it's used even in, in circuits, uh, microprocessors and so forth, where I might throw down some, some Schottky diodes uh, in, in, in next to, it's very easy to get a Schottky. Put, put some, evaporate some metal on a uh, low dope substrate, boom, you got a Schottky diode. See, it's easier, because when you're making a microprocessor, um, you know, PN junction dopants move around on you. So actually, a shot key allows you to almost get a smaller footprint, in some sense, if you can control it. So, so yes, metal semiconductors, because it's a unipolar device, has a lot of merit in strategic places, strategic applications.
questions? 615, been hacking at it for over an hour and a half probably, right? <coughs> okay. Oh, I saw one last question. No. Uh, could you just clarify on the diagram you drew on the lower parts what those parts are? On this? Yes. Yeah, what these are? I mean, I, I know what they are, but can we just then like, clarify? <laughs> this is the fact that uh, it's, it's actually the same basis as the early effect for base width modulation. As I'm reverse biasing, the depletion region is growing, and the drift current component of a PN junction is the generation in <coughs> the depletion region. So if the depletion width is uh, increasing in volume linearly with uh, voltage, then the amount of, of, of generation current that I can collect, because now my volume is increasing, also goes up. So this linearly decreases. And then here I can either have the Zener tunneling, but that only happens, you know, remember Zener happens where the bands uh, overlap. And so that either happens at a very low voltage or it doesn't happen at all. And it comes out and it gets, because then the depletion region grows too large and I can't quantum mechanically tunnel. So Zener is either is low voltage. So it either happens right away or it doesn't happen at all. And then if that doesn't happen, you're, what's waiting for you is the avalanche. Where the carriers pick up so much kinetic energy that when they hit the lattice, they actually trigger another electron hole pair to be generated. And you get this cascading avalanche, right? That's why you use the term avalanche. And it's very useful, actually. Recognize that everyone, th everyone thinks that that's a, that's a destructive, that it's, everyone thinks that it's analogous to this. No. Avalanche photodiodes are probably the backbone of, of fiber optic communications because it allows me to take a very small, small signal, photodiodes, uh, photo signal that's coming through the optical fiber, attenuated by going through 200 kilometers. And an avalanche photodiode allows you to have gain right at the very first stage of your, of your, um, um, of your um, uh, receiver. Your photodiode itself has gain built into it. That's what an avalanche photodiode does. After avalanche has occurred, like the diode is still active, or if you if you if you have a current limiter where you don't let it get to be really really high current. Then you're going to also, because you will eventually get to failure. Yeah, if I really let it go. But an avalanche photodiode might actually allow you to do photon counting. <coughs> Imagine I could actually have a situation where I'm photon limited, five photons are in. I don't know if you ever saw this physics experiment. It's almost one of my undergraduate research projects when I was your age, where we're going to look at this huge cube of water in a salt mine buried in the earth. And they were going to look for proton decay. I don't know if you heard about that. The protons, there was, it was speculated that a proton will decay every so many uh, millions or billions of years. So they figured if they put all this water, they were going to have photo detectors, highly sensitive photo detectors, layered all around this cube in, uh, underground. And that if a proton decayed, it would decay with a certain column of light and you would detect uh, the light output from the single proton decay and so but obviously a single photon out you had to have very high gain photo detectors I almost did that but I ended up doing laser fusion instead okay have a good one see you on Friday Friday 12 noon in the normal uh, classroom where we have class